the interview. The small yellow beetle drove along the deserted, solitary road, and as it wound its way up through the desolate mountains, Jack Torrance felt that this could be the last road on earth. Out of nowhere, the Overlook Hotel appeared in the distance. It was an imposing structure. A sprawling and secluded hotel built on a plateau with stunning views of the surrounding snow-capped mountains. Jack was instantly impressed with its ominous beauty. He parked his beetle in the half-empty car park, sure that the staff and guests would be already leaving before the winter months blew in with their treacherous blizzards. He strolled into the grand entrance, soaking in the vintage architecture. He was surprised he wasn't as nervous as he thought he would be. After all, the overlook was quite intimidating. He tried to immerse himself in its history, to absorb its atmosphere. Jack was a writer, and this is what writers did. They observed. They allowed themselves to be saturated by their environment. Jack had a very good feeling about this place. Within minutes, he was in Mr. Ullman's office. Ullman was the hotel manager, a welcoming and amiable chap. The interview that followed was pleasant enough and Jack felt that he and Ullman connected quite well. Ullman outlined the menial tasks of the winter caretaker job, maintaining the boiler to avoid any costly damage, heating the place on a daily basis and repairing anything as it occurs in a timely manner. To be honest, the job feels very attractive, Jack said with his trademark grin. You see, I'm outlining a, a new writing project and five months of peace is just what we need. Jack informed Ullman that his wife, Wendy, and small son, Danny, will be joining him at the Overlook for the duration of his employment. Which brings me to the next point, said Ullman in a somber tone. The winters up here can be harsh. The solitude and isolation can become a problem. Jack raised his inquisitive eyebrows. He was intrigued. Ullman went on to recount the tragic events concerning a previous caretaker during the winter of 1970, a Mr. Delbert Grady. The man had killed his entire family with an axe. He'd stacked them up neatly in the west wing before putting both barrels of a shotgun in his mouth. It appears to have been a serious case of cabin fever have been locked in together over a long period of time, concluded Ullman. Jack was aghast, yet unaffected. His impish smile resurfaced. His eyebrows arched. Wendy would be fascinated. After all, she was a confirmed ghost story and horror movie addict. Back at their small rented apartment in Boulder, Wendy and Danny waited patiently for Jack to ring. They ate a sandwich. The cheerful sound of Bugs Bunny played on the TV in the background. Wendy's demeanour was friendly, open and very talkative, her gibbering often a facade of the nervousness she often felt inside. Their son was her life. She was fiercely protective over him. Danny was a pale little boy, who never seemed to have the time to form friendships with other children. He did have Tony, though. Tony was his invisible playmate, who lived in his mouth. Although it was a little bizarre, Wendy didn't worry too much about Tony. After all, it was normal for young children to develop invisible playmates, and then eventually grow out of them. She often included Tony in conversations with Danny. What about Tony? Would he be looking forward to going to the hotel, I bet? Smiled Wendy. No, I ain't, Mrs. Torrance. I don't want to go there, said Danny, talking in a strange, whispery voice while wiggling his finger. Wendy smiled, reassuring Danny and Tony that everything was going to be fine and they would all have a great time. She returned to her sandwich. She was certain that Tony represented Danny's inner feelings, the ones he didn't always want to talk about. A little later that night, as Danny brushed his teeth alone in the bathroom, he asked Tony how his father was faring at the hotel. Tony responded that Jack now had the job. 
and was about to ring Wendy to break the news. At that precise moment, the telephone rang, breaking the silence. Wendy picked it up. It was Jack. He told her he still had a few things to go through and wasn't going to be back home until after nine that night. So it sounds like you got the job, said Wendy breezily. Right, said Jack. You and Danny are going to love it up here. It's beautiful. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, Danny stared at his reflection in the mirror and asked Tony why he didn't want to go up to the hotel. Tony didn't want to tell. Please, said Danny. It was very intense. Eventually, Tony relented, but not with words, but with pictures in the boy's mind. Danny froze as he was forced to witness an opulent lift entrance, its doors slowly sliding open as gallons of blood spewed outwards, splattering on the pristine walls. It was horrifying and unnerving, but he couldn't stop the images. He knew deep down why Tony didn't want to go to the Overlook Hotel. There was something terribly wrong with the place. Closing Day The Torrances had packed up and left Boulder a few hours ago. Jack's car once again drove along the now familiar, yet still foreboding solitary mountain road. They wouldn't be coming back for five long months. Wendy noticed how crisp and cold the air was becoming as they meandered higher and higher through the mountains. When they eventually arrived, Jack already noticed a huge difference from the last time he'd been there. The place was now virtually empty, and their voices echoed in the now desolate foyer. The hotel was closed and only a small team of management staff remained, but soon they too would be gone. The Torrance's luggage was collected, Mr. Omen having arranged it to be taken to the small apartment within the Overlook that they were going to be residing in during the long, bleak winter months. Danny was left to play in the games room while Mr. Omen took Jack and Wendy on a tour of the hotel to help them familiarise themselves with their surroundings. He showed them the stunning Colorado Lounge with its intricate Indian-designed glass windows and carved wood. He proudly shared some of the hotel's rich history as they walked through the never-ending corridors. The Overlook's construction had been completed in 1909, and it was reported to have been built on an Indian burial ground. In its time, the Jet Set, Royalty, and even four presidents had all stayed there on many occasions. Wendy gushed endlessly, not stopping for breath, mesmerised by its splendour and beauty. Meanwhile, in the deserted games room, Danny played darts alone. The hairs on his neck prickled. He could feel another presence in the room. He turned round to see two young girls standing in the doorway. They were identical twins, dressed in pale blue dresses with pink sashes. The girls stared at one another, then turned and walked out of the room without muttering a word. Meanwhile, Mr. Ullman showed the Torrances the staff wing of the hotel, which was a lot more basic. No bold architecture to be had there. This was for the menial staff. He introduced them to their modest two-bedroom quarters, it was small, functional, and self-contained. Wendy, forever the optimist, loved it. Once outside, Omen showed them the Overlook's famous maze which stood in the grounds. Its hedges were 13 feet high and as old as the hotel itself. It was truly an imposing yet impressive spectacle. I wouldn't want to wander there alone, he laughed. It could take hours to find yourself out of here. On their way back to the main building, Omen pointed out a snowcat, a large red vehicle parked nearby beneath the canopy. The gold room was next, a sprawling ballroom that could hold hundreds of guests. It was decorated with sleek red sofas and opulent chandeliers. 
Wendy laughed at Jack, mocking a dance that they could have on a party night. Omen told them that all the booze was removed from the premises when they were closed, as part of their insurance in case of accidents. It's a good job because none of us drink, said Jack. It was the first time he'd said anything for a while. A jolly, bald-headed man approached them. Omen introduced him to the Torrances. It was Dick, Dick Halloran, the hotel's larger-than-life cook. Mr Halloran wasn't the only one to join the party, as one of the managers brought in Danny, who'd been looking for his parents outside. Mr Omen suggested that Mr Halloran show Wendy and Danny the kitchen area while he finalised the final handover to Jack. The kitchen area was huge and almost a maze in itself. Wendy felt a little intimidated by the scale of the place, suggesting she'd have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs to find her way around. Mr Halloran showed them the walk-in freezers and all of the food that they had at their disposal. Wendy liked the man, was fantastic with Danny. However, she observed he called Danny Duck, which was odd. It was a cute little nickname that she and Jack had given Danny, but didn't remember calling him that once since he arrived at the Overlook. Well, anyway, he looks like a duck, doesn't he? Mr Halloran laughed, kneeling down to Danny's level. Nah, what's up, duck? he teased. Next, Mr Halloran showed them the storeroom, which housed all the dry and tinned foods. As Mr Halloran started reeling off all of the food that was there for Wendy, he glared at Danny. Would you like some ice cream, Doc? He said in a voice in Danny's head. It was Mr. Halloran's voice, but the words were in Danny's head. They weren't coming out of his mouth. As Mr. Halloran guided them out and locked up the storeroom, Omen and Jack returned and requested that Wendy join them so that he could discuss the maintenance they would be providing in the basement. He left Danny in the company of Mr. Halloran. While Danny ate his chocolate ice cream, Mr. Halloran sat observing him. He asked Danny if he knew how he had known his name was Doc. Danny was unresponsive. Mr. Halloran could remember when he was young, a little boy. He could hold an entire conversation with his grandmother without them ever opening their mouths. She'd called it shining, and he knew that Danny could shine too. At first, Danny was a little reluctant to talk, but eventually the cook managed to gain his trust. Danny told him all about Tony, and how he showed him images. They were like dreams, but different. Tony also forbade him from talking about it to anyone else, including his parents. Mr. Halloran explained that like some people, some places could also shine. They could show you things that had not happened yet, or had happened a long time ago. The Overlook was such a place, and not all of the things were good. Has Tony ever told you about this place? asked Mr Halloran. Danny thought long and hard. What's in room 237? he asked. Mr. Halloran's smile faltered and his seriousness took hold. Don't you ever go in room 237. You have no business going in there, so stay out. His voice was stern. It was almost an order. A month later, the overlook stood in the hazy morning light, as if anticipating the snowfall that would surely cut them off from the rest of the world. Animal cries echoed in the wilderness. Even nature was going to sleep. The sprawling spaces contained within the walls of the hotel didn't feel much different to what was outside. It felt empty, foreboding. A space built to house hundreds of people, yet no one was there. A stillness hung in the air, cloying and suffocating. Wendy had cooked breakfast. She strolled back to the living quarters, pushing a shiny silver trolley along the seemingly endless hallways. 
At the same time, Danny pedalled his go-kart along the maze-like corridors, its wheels running silently across carpet, then thundering across sections of hard floor. Silence, then thunder. Silence, then thunder. Wendy eventually arrived back at their quarters and woke Jack with his breakfast. He'd slept longer than expected in the dead silence. He'd been staying up late, outlining his novel idea. He gazed at his reflection in the mirror as he ate, listening to Wendy gibbering endlessly about them going for a walk outside. He was already getting a little consumed in his novel, and he felt a stirring of irritation. If the hotel offered him dead silence he craved, why did Wendy insist on ruining it? As they talked, Jack admitted he'd fallen in love with the hotel upon his first arrival. It was as if he'd been there before. Jack had set up his writing routine in the Colorado lounge. His typewriter sat in the centre of a large wooden table. It was lonely, awaiting Jack's fingers to dance across its keys. The blank page hung limply from its gaping jaws, awaiting words. An abandoned cigarette burned in an ashtray as Jack threw a ball against the wall then caught it endlessly. The sound of the ball echoed hauntingly across the room. Jack was frustrated. Later, Wendy and Danny entered the maze. Like thoughts in a fevered mind, they wandered around the endless labyrinthine twists and turns, reaching its many dead ends and being forced to turn around. Deeper they went, laughing and playing. At the same time, Jack wandered around the empty corridors of the Overlook, throwing his ball. He was agitated. A few ideas were coming, but none of them good ones. He stopped and pondered at the small-scale replica of the maze that stood in the grand foyer. He seemed hypnotized. Meanwhile, Wendy and Danny had eventually made it to the centre of the maze, a rectangular area with seating. Now they had the long task of finding their way back out. Tuesday. The winter winds whipped against the walls of the overlook. The air had a chilling bite as the year grew older and the darkness loomed. Wendy cooked alone in the kitchen watching television. The local news was playing and the reporter warned of a huge snowstorm that was on its way to Colorado. Danny was on his go-kart again. He enjoyed racing around the endless empty corridors, his little legs spinning as the cart went faster and faster. He came to a sudden stop and glanced around. Room 237 stood nearby. Danny couldn't resist the temptation to walk up to it. He knew it was forbidden, but he couldn't help himself. He twisted the door handle, finding it locked. A vision leapt into his head. It was those twin girls again. They were standing, staring at him. Fear swept through him and he stood away from the door and climbed back in his go-kart. He rode away as fast as he could. The ominous clicking of Jack's typewriter keys echoed around the cavernous lounge, shattering the silence with every stroke. Jack was finally writing. His face was a mask of pure concentration, and he was in full flow, the words pouring from his subconscious and onto the page. Wendy entered the room, shattering the mood with her ever chirpy voice and asking how things were going. Jack couldn't mask the seething anger he felt upon her intrusion. She kissed his cheek and told him it was going to snow that night. Jack sat with an incredulous look. And what do you want me to do about it? He offered quietly, silent rage still coursing through his veins. Wendy smiled in an attempt to diffuse the tension, telling him not to be grouchy, which didn't help. Furious, Jack tore the sheet of paper from the typewriter and shredded it with his fingers. 
He told her that her interruptions were breaking his concentration. He laid down a new ground rule that she should not enter if he is in there, whether she heard him typing or not. Now do you think you can handle that? He said with an intense seriousness. Wendy was hurt. She nodded numbly and left the room, her heavy footsteps echoing loudly until she disappeared. Even that irritated him. He inserted a new piece of paper and pushed the return carriage. Thursday. As predicted, the snow had arrived and the entire hotel grounds were enveloped in a whiteout. Wendy and Danny played snowball fights enjoying the sudden change in the weather. As they ran, the snowdrifts had gathered high against the walls of the overlook. If the weather persisted, the entire building could be covered. Jack sat motionless, unblinking, staring out of the window at them. He looked pale, unshaven, deathly. If it wasn't for the flickering flames and the burning fire behind him, you would think it was a still image. Saturday The blizzard continued to rage outside. The wind screeched and howled. The dark turrets of the hotel poked out against the misty blanket of white, as if trying to hold off the all-consuming snowstorm. It didn't appear to be winning this battle. Jack was typing in the Colorado lounge, which had become his huge, sprawling writing room. He appeared to love the solitude it held within its walls. Wendy tried the telephone lines on the switchboard. None of them worked. She wandered around into Ullman's deserted office, where she contacted the forest rangers on the radio, asking if there was a problem with the lines. The garbled voice of the man on the other end confirmed that the severe weather was causing issues and it was a common occurrence in winter time. He pointed out that the lines would be down until next spring as nobody could get access to repair them. The ranger asked Wendy to leave the radio communications on the whole time, just in case they needed to contact them. As she ended the conversation, Wendy heard the howling wind outside the window finally beginning to feel the weight of the isolation herself. As the weather stopped anyone from venturing outside the hotel, Danny could do little but play on his go-kart again. As he rode around the corridors of the staff wing, he came face to face with the two girls. They stood at the end of the corridor, side by side, staring at him. Danny saw a glimpse of the two girls lying dead on the floor. Blood spatter covered the walls. An axe lay in front of their blood-soaked bodies. He was terrified and cupped his hands over his face to block out the horrifying image. Tony, I'm scared, he whispered, staring at his finger. It started to bend as Tony responded. Remember what Mr. Halloran said. It's just like pictures in a book, Danny. It isn't real. Monday. The blizzard continued to batter the window panes relentlessly as Wendy and Danny lay watching television in the hotel lobby. It was a bad daytime soap. Danny asked if he could go and get his fire engine from the living quarters. Not right now. Daddy's asleep, murmured Wendy, engrossed in the TV. I won't make any noise, I promise. I'll tiptoe, he replied. Wendy gave in, letting the boy go. Jack had only gone to bed a few hours ago and was spending more and more time away from them. Danny quietly opened the door to their living area and entered the silence. He peeked through the open bedroom door and found his father not sleeping 
but sitting up, staring into space. Jack turned and stared at Danny. He looked terrible. He asked Danny to come over to him. Danny did, but felt a stab of reluctance. As Jack pulled the boy into his lap, he asked, How's it going, Doc? Are you having a good time? It was awkward. Sinister. A facade. Yes, I am, Dad, whispered Danny. Danny dared to ask if his dad liked the hotel. Jack stared blankly at the boy, telling him he loved it. Don't you? he asked Danny. I guess so, said Danny in a strained voice. I wish we could stay here forever and ever and ever. Danny had heard those words before. Dad? What? Jack was a little sharper. Patience was wearing thin. You'd never hurt Mummy and me, would you? Jack's stare was piercing. Did your mother ever say that to you? That I would hurt you? He probed. No, Dad, said Danny. I love you more than anything in the whole world. I'd never do anything to hurt you. Never, said Jack. Wednesday The hotel was still buried in snow, and it was getting higher. It looked bleak, devoid of life. Inside, Danny played with his toy cars. They were in a circle in the middle of one of those long corridors. A ball gently rolled along, neatly aimed at him. He looked up, but there was no one there. Who had pushed it? Danny stood up, feeling a little scared. He wandered down the corridor where the ball had come from. He found a door open. The fob hanging from the key read, Room 237. After a little hesitation, Danny's curiosity got the better of him. He just couldn't resist. Finally, Danny entered. Wendy was busy doing some maintenance in the basement boiler room when she heard screaming. It was Jack. She gasped and ran out of the basement to find him. In the Colorado lounge, Jack was slumped over the desk with his typewriter asleep. He twitched in the grip of a dream and screamed in terror. Wendy fled along the corridors in panic and finally reached him. He woke abruptly and fell to the floor. As he came to, he told her he'd had the most terrible nightmare ever. He told her that in his dream he'd killed her and Danny and chopped them into tiny little pieces. Wendy comforted her husband as Danny strolled into the room. Wendy glanced over. He must have heard Jack screaming. She told Danny to go and play in his room for a while, but Danny was unresponsive and just kept walking toward her. She ran over to him and realised there was something terribly wrong. Danny was sucking on his thumb in a comatose state. There was bruising on his neck and his clothes were torn. Wendy held Danny close and suddenly looked over to Jack, where he sat staring into space. In her heart, she believed that Jack had done this. She stood and backed away. She screamed at him, accusing him of hurting their own son. Jack could only look at her blankly, confused. Even he seemed unsure himself. She left the room, leaving Jack in a state of terrifying bewilderment. Jack wandered around the hotel. His feelings of confusion had developed into anger and frustration. He swung at the air in an attempt to vent his rage. He entered the gold ballroom and flicked on the lights, revealing the huge, empty space with its red sofas scattered around. The moaning of the blizzard was the only sound.
The bar stood ahead of him, lit up and ready for action, yet it was lifeless. Jack stumbled toward it, passing the endless empty tables and chairs where many a party reveller had sat in their formal evening wear over the decades. Like a moth to a flame, Jack was attracted to the brightly lit bar. He perched on a stool and stared at his reflection in the mirrored wall of the empty shelves that once held rows and rows of exquisite bottles. Christ, he could do with a drink. Just one. He rubbed his eyes, feeling helpless at his loss of control. A slippery slope of no return. Hi, Lloyd, he said to an invisible barman. He scanned the room. Things seem a little slow tonight. He then burst into manic laughter at his own joke. It echoed around the ballroom, somehow making the place seem even eerier. But Jack wasn't alone. Lloyd stood in front of him. Clean-shaven, slicked back hair and dressed in an immaculate tuxedo. His closed smile was locked, passive, a servant without character or opinion, eager to please. The shelves behind him were no longer empty, but full of the most colourful and exquisite bottles of liquor you could name. Yes, things are a little slow tonight, Mr. Torrance, he said in a monotone voice. He leaned closer, his gleaming eyes and blinking. So, what will it be? It was music to Jack's ears. He had two tens tucked away in his wallet and had believed they were going to be there until next spring. He asked for a bottle of bourbon, a small glass and some ice. Lloyd was only too happy to take the order, tumbling ice into the small glass. You set him up and I'll knock him back one by one, said Jack with growing excitement. As the dark bourbon tipped over the ice, Jack fumbled for his wallet, finding that his money wasn't there. He fished for an explanation, but Lloyd insisted that Jack's credit within the hotel was fine. See, I've always liked you, Lloyd. You're the best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. Jack raised his glass. He's the five long months on the wagon and all the irreparable harm it's caused me. He swallowed the whiskey and shuddered with glee as he felt the burn travel down his chest. Lloyd poured another. Their conversation moved to Jack's current issues, namely Wendy. Lloyd was agreeable and seemed to say all the right things. I didn't lay a hand on him, Jack added. I wouldn't touch a hair in his goddamn head. I love him. But as long as I live, she will never let me forget what happened. Lloyd remained silent. Jack continued to ramble and admitted he'd once hurt Danny. It had been an accident. Completely unintentional. It had happened three years ago when he'd thrown Jack's papers all over. All Jack had tried to do was pull him up. In doing so, he'd ended up dislocating the boy's arm. Just then there was a shriek. It came from Wendy. She was calling out Jack's name from somewhere out in the corridors. She ran into the gold room looking terrified, clutching a baseball bat. There was no Lloyd, no bottle, no glass, just Jack sitting on the stool staring at his reflection in the empty space. There's someone in the hotel with us, she sobbed, fighting for breath. There's a crazy woman in one of the rooms. She tried to strangle Danny, she added. Jack could only glare at her. She was pathetic, red-nosed and shrieking. Always overly hysterical. With a tired glare, Jack asked what room it was. He would go and investigate. Many miles away, a sweltering heat wave gripped Miami. Dick Halloran was relaxing on a bed in his hotel room. He watched the news report that covered the treacherous weather in Colorado. Terrible snowdrifts had blocked highways 
and countless people were now stranded. Suddenly, the droning voice of a news reporter faded away as a vision gripped him. His mouth and eyes opened wide, and he saw the open door of room 237 and a terrified Danny shaking uncontrollably. Someone was inside room 237. The door stood open, the key fob hanging from the lock. Bedside lamps were softly lit and it looked like somebody was occupying the room. The door was pushed open, revealing an immaculate art deco bathroom, decorated with a beautiful and opulent green suite. Everything was perfect and symmetrical. A shower curtain was draped halfway across the bathtub. Someone was behind it. A hand pulled the shower curtain open. It was a lady. She was naked and her wet skin was glistening. Jack looked at the woman open-mouthed, his lips curling into a devilish, lustful smile. The woman stood up. She was beautiful, yet otherworldly. She offered no words as she stepped out of the water and padded toward him. When she stopped halfway, she invited him over with her eyes. He responded, and she raised her hands to caress his chest. She wrapped her arms around him, and Jack did the same to her. She leaned forward, and their lips met. They kissed passionately, and he closed his eyes in the moment. It was then when he noticed that she had become unresponsive. He stopped and froze at the reflection in the mirror. He held an old woman in his arms. She was wrinkled and patches of mould were dotted on her bare buttocks. She'd obviously been dead for some time. Her grey sagging skin was wrinkled and hung in flaps. Jack pulled away in disgust as he heard a shrill cackle escape from her lips. She laughed at him, a mocking toothless hag. He backed away in terror and she followed him with her endless laughter. She shuffled along, her stiff arms raised zombie-like. He left the room and slammed the door, locking it behind him. He fled along the empty corridor still hearing her endless cackle echo in his mind. In Miami, Dick Halloran rang the Overlook Hotel. He was troubled by his disturbing vision, but found the call could not be taken. Was Danny trying to reach him with his mind? Back at the Overlook, Wendy paced up and down in their living quarters, awaiting Jack's return. Danny was asleep. She heard a knock on the door and she was relieved to find Jack. Still shaken, she asked if he found anything, but Jack said he hadn't. Wendy was confused. She asked if he'd gone into the right room. He said he had, and he recounted finding the door open with the lights on but nothing was out of the ordinary. Wendy went over Danny's story again, but it didn't make sense. What about the bruises on his neck? I think he did it to himself, Jack murmured. Wendy shook her head. It wasn't possible, but Jack tried to reason with her. Once he ruled out Danny's version of what happened, There was no other explanation. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, Danny lay awake. His eyes opened wide in terror. He could hear his parents' discussion in his mind. He heard his mother say she wanted to get Danny out of the overlook 
Danny's face contorted into a silent scream as another vision invaded his mind. It was the lift doors opening again, gallons of blood gushing out onto the walls. It's so typical of you to create a problem like this when I'm finally trying to accomplish something, said Jack, rage seeping from his gaze. He yelled at her, accusing her of trying to ruin any success that he'd been trying to create. He stormed out of her room, leaving her alone. Wendy felt hopeless and abandoned. Jack stormed around the hotel kitchen, swiping pans and piles of utensils to the floor as he passed, reveling in his destruction. He grinned manically at the sound of soft ballroom music that was filtering down the corridor. It was a 1920s crooner. All along the corridor by the lifts were balloons and party poppers. It was like there was a social event taking place, yet not a soul was seen. Jack decided to investigate further. Still in Miami, Dick Halloran was now trying to get in touch with the emergency services in Colorado. Finally, he managed to get through to the fire service and mentioned his trouble getting through to the Overlook Hotel. He asked the operator to try and contact the Torrances on their radio to do a welfare check. The ranger asked Mr. Halloran to ring them back in 20 minutes whilst he tried to contact the hotel. Jack was approaching the ballroom, hearing the ragtime tune, Midnight, the Stars and You, warbling in the distance. He saw cigarette smoke lingering in the corridor, as if somebody had been there moments before. The air was full of chattering voices and laughter as Jack entered the ballroom. He wasn't surprised to see the room alive with hundreds of people lounging on the red sofas. They were all dressed in their finest. Gloved, eloquent ladies sucked on long cigarette holders. They wore pearls and feathered headbands while scores of men laughed, dressed in expensive tuxedos, and hung off their every word. It was unmistakably the 1920s, yet no one seemed to notice Jack in his scruffy check shirt and jeans as he shuffled toward the bar. Lloyd was serving. He spotted Jack and ambled over, pouring him a glass of bourbon on the rocks. Jack offered him a note from his wallet, but Lloyd told him the drink was free of charge. Jack was confused. He pulled a face. Jack was the kind of guy who needed to know who was buying his drinks. Your money's no good here, said Lloyd, with that same benign locked grin. As Jack tried to make sense of the comment, he added, Orders from the house, so drink up, Mr. Torrance. That seemed enough to appease Jack. He picked up his drink and walked away from the bar into the noisy crowd. He swayed clumsily to the music, but just then, a waiter, struggling with a tray of drinks, bumped into Jack, spilling them all over him. The waiter apologised profusely, claiming the advocar on the drink would stain. He ushered Jack into the gentleman's room, to allow him to clean him up. They entered the restroom, which was painted a garish red, with rows of mirrors and gleaming porcelain sinks. Jack allowed the man to fuss over his jacket with a cloth and water. So what's your name, Jeevesy? Jack asked. The name is Grady, sir. Delbert Grady, the waiter added cheerfully. There was a glimmer of recognition from Jack. He asked if he'd seen Grady somewhere before. Grady said he hadn't. He was still far too engrossed in the spilt advocar. Mr. Grady, weren't you once the caretaker here? Jack asked, adding his devilish grin to the mix. Mr. Grady said he wasn't. 
but Jack knew he was onto something. It was the writer in him. He knew when someone was hiding something. Jack asked Grady if he was married. He said he was. He had a wife and two daughters. Jack asked where they were now. Grady was unsure, claiming they were around somewhere. Jack then interrupted the man by taking the cloth from his hands. Grady stopped and looked at Jack for the first time. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here. I recognize you. I saw your picture in the newspaper. You, um, chopped your wife and daughters up into little bits, and then you blew your brains out. Grady stared back at Jack for what seemed an eternity, claiming to have no recognition of ever doing that. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here, Jack repeated. Grady's demeanour had changed, his fussing now abandoned. His eyes were locked on Jack. No, you are the caretaker, Mr. Torrance. You've always been the caretaker. And I should know, sir, because I've always been here, whispered Grady. His tone had shifted. It became almost sinister. His eyes bore into Jack's. Did you know, Mr. Torrance, that your son is attempting to bring an outside party into this situation? Troubled, Jack shook his head. Grady told him it was the cook, but Jack didn't understand. He asked Grady how this was. Your son has a very great talent, whispered Grady. I don't think you're aware of how great it is. But he is attempting to use this talent against your will. Jack looked perplexed. He was unable to respond. Something about those words resonated deep within him. They connected, but didn't make any logical sense. Eventually, Jack sneered. Well, he, um, he is a very willful boy. Mr. Grady nodded. It's, um, it's his mother. She interferes, Jack added. Perhaps they need a good talking to, if you don't mind me saying so. Perhaps a little more. My girl, sir. They didn't care for the overlook at first. One of them even stole a pack of matches to try and burn it down. But I corrected them, sir. And when my wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty, I corrected her. Grady's eyes continued to burn into Jack's, unblinking, full of malice. Wendy pierced the room alone. She inhaled deeply on a cigarette in a desperate attempt to calm her frayed nerves. But it wasn't really working. She was nervous, fidgety. It felt like she was running out of options. The snow cat was outside. If there was a break in the weather, perhaps they could get into it. She could call the forest rangers. They could search for them and if... If Jack refused to leave, then she would have to take Danny herself. The strange voice came from the bedroom. Danny? Wendy flew into the bedroom. Danny was sitting up in the darkness, mumbling the word Red Room over and over, staring into nothingness. Wendy tried to comfort him. Was he having a bad dream? Danny's eyes met hers, but she knew it wasn't Danny. 
Danny is not here, Mrs. Torrance, mumbled Tony. Come on, honey, wake up, she whispered softly. She didn't like this. Why was he acting like this? Danny can't wake up, Mrs. Torrance, croaked Tony. Wendy was panicked. Wake up, she yelled, gripping her son in desperation. Downstairs, Jack wandered around the dark hotel foyer. The forest ranger's voice echoed in the distance. It was coming from Ullman's office. Jack entered the room and glared at the receiver. He methodically removed its cover, exposing the circuitry inside. He reached in and snatched out the component. Instantly, the comforting voice from the outside world fell silent. They were all alone now. Back in Miami, Dick Halloran was again pestering the forest rangers. They informed him they had been unable to get a response from the Torrances, but they would try again later on. Exasperated, Halloran left it there. There wasn't anything more he could do here. He couldn't tell the rangers about the gnawing horror he felt in his gut. He wouldn't dare try to explain to them that he was receiving terrifying thoughts from a small boy hundreds of miles away. They'd think he was mad. 8 a.m. Halloran sat on the plane, heading north, back to Denver, Colorado. He sat alone in his seat. The terror within him intensified as he got closer. God only knew what he would find when he reached the overlook, and whatever he did find, he had the feeling God wouldn't be able to help either. The plane finally appeared through the treacherous storm clouds and touched down in a bleak and wintry Denver. The plane was barely visible as a taxi to the terminal in the howling, tumbling winds. There had been more reports of blizzards and roadblocks on the mountain roads. Luckily, Halloran had the foresight to arrange the hire of a snowcat from a local garage. That would get him to the overlook. He just prayed that he would get there in time. Back at the hotel, Wendy and Danny sat watching television on the sofa. She smoked endlessly her whole body shaken with anxiety. Danny sat in silence, unable to even focus on the cartoons playing on the screen. Wendy glanced at her watch. Where was Jack? Why had he not been back to the room since they had that last argument? What was he doing? Doc? I'm going to have to go and talk to your daddy for a few minutes but I want you to stay just here. I'm going to lock the door behind me, okay? Yes, Mrs. Torrance, whispered Tony. He was still talking as Tony, and a part of her crumbled. It was written all over her face. She just hoped Danny didn't realise she needed to be strong for her son. As she left, she picked up a baseball bat. She couldn't be too careful. Wendy thought she'd find Jack in the Colorado lounge, but he wasn't there. Grey daylight streamed through its windows, but it was poor, leaving most of the huge room in a semi-darkness. She looked around, then gravitated over to his empty writing desk pouring over the paper inserted within it. Strange. She saw the same line typed over and over. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Wendy twisted the return, revealing more lines of the same sentence. Her eyes widened. She held her breath as a new wave of anxiety 
gripped her. She glanced at the huge wad of completed manuscript that sat next to the typewriter. Surely not. He'd been writing this for months. Wendy flicked through the pages, her eyes focusing on the same creepy sentence over and over, filling every page. The formatting wasn't even the same, but those words were. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. She felt a sting of tears pooling in her terrified eyes as she lifted page after page, her horror deepening with each one. All this time and this is what he'd been writing. How do you like it? Jack said calmly. Wendy screamed and sprung around on the spot, clutching the baseball bat tightly. Jack stepped out from the shadows and padded toward her with a mad grin. She had no idea he'd been watching her from the shadows. She had no idea of the deep fury that burned within him like hellfire. Wendy remained frozen with fear, desperately trying to process her thoughts. He asked what she was doing there. To talk, she offered, shaken to the core. And what do you want to talk about? He asked, stepping closer. She fumbled with her words. She couldn't remember. She tried to keep what was left of her crumbling composure. She stepped backwards, eager to keep the distance between her and her husband. Upstairs, Danny sat wide-eyed. He could see and hear the events unfolding in his mind. I think we should talk about Danny, he heard his father say. The blood from the lift doors flooding his vision. A closed door with the word Red Room scrawled upon it. Back downstairs, Jack continued to back Wendy toward the staircase. We should discuss what should be done with him, he said with a manic glee. Wendy said she didn't know, but Jack didn't believe her. Maybe we should take him to a doctor, she offered, her voice cracking with terror. Maybe he should be taken to a doctor. He was mimicking her, mocking her. Jack continued to edge towards his terrified wife. The conversation switched to her not caring about him or his responsibility to his employers. Jack was the victim. She'd always held him back. It was her fault he was a failure. Jack became demented, furious. His rage deepened. His hatred for her emanated from every pore. His eyebrows arched. His grin was dangerous. Stay away, she commanded weakly. Wendy swung the bat half-heartedly toward him, trying to prove she was willing to use it. She was now halfway up the stairs. I just want to go back to my room. I need to think things over. You've had your whole life to think things over. What's a few minutes more going to do? He shouted. Wendy swung the bat. It was fight or flight. She begged for him to stay away, but he continued to mock her, almost daring her to strike. Wendy, I'm not going to hurt you, he mused. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your brains in. He laughed like a madman and flicked out his tongue as he grabbed at her with his hands threateningly. Wendy had reached breaking point. She lashed out with the bat, hitting Jack on the hand. He seemed surprised, then without hesitation, she brought the bat down hard on the side of his head. Jack was stunned. He reached out to her, then plummeted backwards down the stairs, tumbling and bouncing off every step before landing in an unconscious heap. The only sound now was Wendy's frenzied sobs. Wendy dragged Jack by the ankles down the corridor to the kitchen area. Blood oozed from his head. He was mumbling incoherently 
is as eyes opened. She struggled to slide open the lock on the walk-in larder as he was slowly gaining consciousness. Before he could make any sense of what was happening to him, she pulled him in and left, locking the door behind her. Jack was trapped. He pounded on the solid metal door, pleading with her to let him out. But she walked away, grabbing a huge kitchen knife for protection, just in case. She hated having to do this, but she had no choice. She had to keep Danny and herself safe from his madness. I'm going to go now, she finally said through the door. I'm going to go now. I'm going to try and get Danny through the sidewinder in the snowcat. And I'll bring back a doctor. Wendy, you've got a big surprise coming to you. You aren't going anywhere. Go check out the snow cat and radio. Go check it out, he said gleefully, almost jumping up and down on the spot. Wendy fled from his mad laughter. It echoed in her head as she prized open the hotel entrance door that was blocked with a huge snowdrift. The hotel grounds were gripped in a whiteout as she fled toward the garage, still clutching the knife for dear life. Standing with its hood wide open and all its innards cut out, Jack was right. It wasn't going anywhere. Nobody was. They were trapped at the Overlook. 4pm. The Overlook stood in the growing darkness. Jack lay asleep in the larder as the wind whistled from the outside. There was a knock on the door and Jack woke groggily. He stumbled to his feet, still confused with the concussion. The voice behind the door wasn't Wendy, but Delbert Grady. He sounded annoyed, put out, accusing Jack of being incapable of taking care of the business that they had discussed. Jack was embarrassed and pointed to deal with things as soon as he got out of there. But Grady had his doubts. He and the others believed Jack's heart was not in it. That he didn't have the belly for it. Jack pleaded for one more chance to prove himself. He agreed to deal with Wendy in the harshest way possible. He gave his word. And Jack smiled as he heard the sound of the door lock being pulled open. Along the sidewinder roads, darkness descended fast as a snowcat ploughed through the thick blanket of snow. The road ahead was bleak and lifeless. Inside, Dick Halloran sat wrapped in thick clothing, his stony face grave with the imminent danger ahead. He could feel Danny's terror eating away at him. At least he knew he was still alive. Back at the Overlook, Danny walked into the living quarters. Except it wasn't Danny. Red rum, croaked Tony endlessly, watching over Wendy, who had eventually fallen asleep. He picked up the knife she brought from the kitchen. Tony stroked the blade of the knife and walked over to the dressing table where he picked up a lipstick. He shuffled over to the closed bathroom door and started scrolling something upon it with the lipstick. It was the word Red Rum. Red Rum, Red Rum, Red Rum. He repeated the word over and over as he turned to Wendy. Tony's voice then left and was replaced by Danny's. Wendy woke with a fright and sat up, taking the knife from her son. As she hugged the boy, trying to break him out of his trance, she noticed the word red rum reflected in the mirror. It spelt murder. There was a loud thump on the door. It was Jack. How did he get out of the larder? He had an axe and he swung it back and forth. Eventually, the door began to splinter. Wendy leapt to her feet and scooped up Danny 
the only place where they could go was through the door with red rum written on it. It led to the bathroom. They entered and Wendy locked the door behind them. She prized open the tiny bathroom window, seeing the high snowdrift that gathered below it, giving them a smooth exit. Jack was now inside their apartment, cheerfully calling out to her that he was home. Inside the bathroom, Wendy pushed Danny through the small opening of the window. He slid down the drift safely and waited for her. Wendy tried always to clamber out of the window after him, but it was useless. She couldn't get through its tiny opening. She told Danny to run, to get away. Her sobs were frenzied, a desperate mother trying to save her son. All she could do was to grab her knife and prepare to face Jack. She gripped the blade and huddled in the corner of the bathroom. Little pigs, little pigs, let me come in, yelled Jack from behind the door. Not by the hair of your chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. The axe embedded into the door. Inside, Wendy screamed as she watched helplessly as the axe hacked away at the door. The wood splintered with every strike. There was nowhere to go. She was trapped. Unable to reason with a raving psychotic madman, she knew she was going to die in there. Jack poked his face through the hole in the door and grinned malevolently. Here's Johnny. As Jack reached inside to unlock the door, Wendy struck him with the knife, slicing open his hand. He screeched in pain as any animal would. Outside through the thick howling blizzard, Dick Halloran approached the overlook. He could see its lights cutting through the darkness. He'd made it. Relief swept through him. Inside the Torrance's room a silence had descended from the madness. Jack and Wendy stood shaking, the room door the only thing separating them. They listened, both unable to believe they could hear the engine of a snowcat pulling up outside. They were confused. It came to a stop. Danny was back inside the overlook and he fled through the kitchen and hid behind the sliding door of a metal pan cupboard. Jack hobbled through the corridors clutching the axe eager to stop the unexpected intruder. He'd left Wendy hiding in the bathroom. He'd finish her later. Dick Halloran staggered up to the hotel in the roaring blizzard. It looked foreboding. Alien, not the place he'd left. He opened the front door and entered, still feeling the terror that emanated from within its walls. He called out for the Torrances. There was no response other than the sound of the howling wind echoing through the hotel's vast emptiness. At least he was here. He could finally help Danny. As Halloran walked along the foyer, Jack suddenly leapt out from the darkness, swinging the axe. The thick blade sliced into Halloran's stomach and he screamed. He collapsed to the floor as blood gushed from the wound. Danny echoed Halloran's scream from his hiding place, feeling the man's pain burn in his stomach. Jack's ears pricked. He heard Danny's cry. It came from the kitchen area. He yelled Danny's name. Hearing how close the danger was, Danny left his hiding place. Jack saw him and started chasing him, yelling as he did so. Wendy fled up the stairs trying to find Jack. She was out of her mind with worry. Where was Danny? Who had been driving the snowcat? She heard voices. She stood in horror at the sight of two strange people entwined together in an open doorway. A man in a dinner suit sat on the bed whilst another was on his knees dressed in an animal costume. Was she as mad as her husband? What was this place? Jack followed Danny and noticed he'd gone through the open front door. Jack flicked on all the outside lights, revealing Danny hiding behind Halloran's snowcat. Jack bellowed at the boy 
as he fled towards the hedge maze. Jack hobbled in manic pursuit. He followed the terrified boy deep into the labyrinthine twists and turns of the maze. It was easy. He followed his son's tiny footprints. He'd catch up with him soon enough. Danny, I'm coming, he barked in the freezing air. Wendy ran through the hotel, following the carnage her husband had left in his wake. She froze at the sight of Dick Halloran in the foyer. Blood still oozed from his fatal axe wound, and it pooled on the once spotless floor. She felt a sudden presence, and turned with a scream to find a strange man standing in a dinner suit. There was a bloodied open wound on his head. Great party, isn't it? Chuckled the man cheerfully. Wendy was hysterical. She ran into the gold room which offered yet more terror. Cobwebs hung from the grand chandeliers and skeletons of long dead guests sat at the tables, still dressed in their finery. She watched as the lift doors opened and gallons of blood erupted from within, spattering over the pristine walls. Outside in the maze, Jack continued to pursue Danny with a dogged persistence. The boy glanced around in terror as he was forced deeper and deeper into the freezing labyrinth. Suddenly, Danny stopped. He had an idea. Slowly, he retraced his steps, leaving a dead end, knowing he could outwit his deranged father. He then huddled behind the hedge and heard his crazed father pass by. Jack was now slowing. His breathing was laboured. Exhaustion took over. He was tired and injured. He looked down to see the small footprints had ended abruptly. Jack bellowed Danny's name and took a turn, then another, unsure of which way he had come from. When Jack had gone out of sight, Danny scampered back along the way they'd came, following his and his father's footprints. This would surely lead him back to the opening of the maze. Jack stood confused still gripping the axe. He was lost. His rasping breath left his body in vaporous wisps. He searched for his son's footprints, unable to see anything clearly in the darkness. He continued throughout the maze, yelling Danny's name and growing weaker with every step. Wendy was outside. She was delighted to see Danny appear at the opening of the maze. Mother and son were reunited and hugged each other tightly. Together, they fled to Halloran's abandoned snowcat. Jack heard the snowcat's engine burst to life and pull away from the overlock. He screamed and howled, unable to stop them. He fell to the ground, helpless, weakened with a bitter cold. In the harsh morning light, Jack remained where he'd fallen. He sat lifeless and rigid in the icy snow, frozen solid. His face locked in an eternal painful grimace of failure. Back inside the overlook, the gleaming polished floor to the gold room was alive with the echoing drone of Midnight, the Stars and You. A collection of pictures were displayed proudly on the wall, all black and white. Snapshots of a bygone era. One of them showed the 4th of July Ball, 1921. Classy guests smiled in the finest gowns and dinner jackets. They raised their glasses in a toast. The smiling man at the very front was familiar. He had a devilish grin. It was Jack. Jack was the caretaker of the Overlook. He'd always been the caretaker.